Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. Today we're going to, once again, be in conversation with Dr. Gerald Horn. Dr. Gerald Horn is a historian. He holds the Moore's Professorship of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston. He is the author of a number of books, including his latest, which we'll be in conversation about. It's called The Counter-Revolution of 1836, Texas Slavery and Jim Crow and the Roots of American Fascism. Gerald Horn, always great to see you. Thank you for taking this time to join me today. Thank you for inviting me. More than a decade ago, you wrote the book and published the book, The Counter-Revolution of 1776, what put out this argument that since we have found in the 1619 Project that a major reason for the Revolutionary War of 1776 was the fear of abolition growing in Europe, particularly in England, and the fear that abolition would be coming to the United States. Again, you wrote this more than a decade ago, preceding what we'd see from the 1619 Project. Your current book, again, is called The Counter-Revolution of 1836. This is a good 60 years later are, do you see this as a continuous story? Is this a part two of a previous story that you were telling? Yes, uh, it might even be a, a multi-part series. What I mean is that it's not difficult to convince people in the United States that 1861, the attempt by Dixie to secede from the United States of America in order to perpetuate enslavement of Africans forevermore was obviously motivated by the desire to not only maintain slavery, but perhaps to reopen the African slave trade. Uh, those with a longer memory would not quibble with the argument that I put forward in my book on the 17th century, that the so-called glorious revolution in England of 1688 was driven in no small measure by the desire of the growing merchant class to elbow the monarch out of the way in terms of capturing the insanely lucrative uh, African slave trade where you could invest $1 and receive a 1,700% return. There are those today who would sell their firstborn for a 1,700% return, not to mention some African they did not know. And so by writing this book by about 1836 in Texas, and I think from preliminary results, that there is little dispute in the popular sense about associating the formation of the so-called Republic of Texas in 1836, an independent country, and then the state of Texas, which crawls into the Union in 1845. There's little dispute in the popular sense about associating uh, this uh, profound maneuver with the desire by Stephen F. Austin, Sam Houston, and the other freebooters uh, who engineered this secession from Mexico, uh, it was obviously driven not only by the desire to perpetuate uh, slavery, but also to grab more land of the indigenous. And it was motivated and driven by the fact that in Mexico, uh, which formerly controlled Tejas or Texas, you had the abolition of slavery in the years preceding 1836, executed by a president of African descent, uh, speaking of Vincente Guerrero. And uh, it's fair to say that uh, many in popular audiences, given Texas's reactionary or retrograde politics today, they feel that there must have been something wrong at the root <laughs> with regard to Texas. And so by writing this book about 1836, I'm trying to, through the back door, revisit <laughs> the argument about 1776, which as your opening comments suggested, uh, was deemed to be overly controversial in certain quarters. Uh, certainly the 1776 thesis that led to the 1776 commission of President Donald J. Trump. It led to a revolt against the 1619 project by many mainstream historians. It led to legislation in many states seeking to circumscribe, if not uh, invalidate the 1619 project. And so by writing about 1836, I'm trying to provide a cushion for the acceptance of the 1776 thesis. You see a thread, I'm assuming here, in history, 
connected to slavery and the movement to end slavery, abolish slavery, and the counter-revolution is the reaction against that. And you, you, you go back to 1688. Again, this was called the Glorious Revolution in England. And, and it's interesting because this isn't this the create, I don't know if it's a creation, but the uh, assertion of a more forceful parliament. So, so in some ways, these are always sort of decked with democratic a spirit of democracy, I guess. Well, it is. And uh, it's true that 1688 led to the clipping of the wings of the monarch uh, to what we see today with Queen Elizabeth and her family, which admittedly is one of the richest families on planet Earth, but certainly does not exercise the kind of political power <laughs> that it exercised before 1688. And I should also say that uh, these books that I've been writing about slavery uh, also invoke the notion of revolution. Uh, that is to say, my book confronting black Jacobins, the, uh, the United States Haitian Revolution, the origins of the Dominican Republic, uh, confronts the epical, profound Haitian Revolution, 1791 to 1804, a successful revolt of the enslaved uh, for those who consider themselves to be advocates of the working class, they should be in the forefront of saluting the Haitian Revolution because this was a case of unpaid workers, that is to say the enslaved, revolting and triumphing. And this sent a frisson of apprehension coursing down the spine of enslavers throughout the hemisphere. It led directly to Britain deciding to evacuate the, its role in the uh, African slave trade in 1807 because the Haitian Revolution from its inception was tied uh, umbilically to the cash cow of Jamaica, uh, one of the most profitable sites of enrichment uh, for London. And then, of course, that led inexorably to Britain moving to abolish slavery in 1833. Uh, this puts pressure uh, in a sense, uh, on the United States and ultimately on Texas, as I suggested in my comment a moment ago, one of the reasons why Texas joins the Union in 1845 and abandons its role as an independent country was because it could not withstand abolitionist pressure uh, from Haiti and, and London, not to mention abolitionists in the United States uh, itself. Uh, keep in mind, that during its brief existence, 1836 to 1845, independent Texas was a leader in the African slave trade. The Lone Star flag could be found off the coast of Angola, Southwest Africa. It could be found off the coast of Brazil, the largest market for depositing African captives. It could be found off the coast of Cuba. In fact, the spectacular rise and the number of enslaved individuals between 1836 and 1845 has a lot to do with the role of independent Texas. I should also say that Texas also was a leader in another inglorious episode in the history of North America. I'm speaking of genocide against the indigenous population. One of the problems that Texas faced that was relatively unique in terms of enslaving states is that it bordered an abolitionist state that is Mexico. Uh, Florida, of course, uh, had problems with Bahamas, but it was not hugging the border of Florida. Uh, Florida had problems with Haiti, but it was not hugging the border of Florida. The Carolinas had a problem with British control of Bermuda, but it was due east, uh, separated by miles uh, of water, miles of ocean. Whereas Texas abutted Mexico, and therefore that led to capital flight in the form of Africans strolling across the border into Mexico. Mexico would not return these captives, and that led to inflamed relations between not only uh, Texas and Mexico, but after Texas joins the United States, it leads to inflamed relations between uh, the United States and Mexico because uh, 
uh, Texas was pressuring Washington persistently to pressure Mexico in turn to return this fleeing capital in the form of enslaved Africans strolling across the border uh, <laughs> into Mexico. And then there's the problem that I uh, foreshadowed uh, in my opening remarks a few seconds ago, where I indicated that Texas was a premier leader in the bloody chapter of genocide against Native Americans. Part of this has to do not only with the fact that the indigenous population oftentimes could find sanctuary like enslaved Africans across the border in Mexico and could use Mexico as a rear base from which to attack independent Texas. And part of it has to do with the unavoidable fact that despite the militancy of many Native American groupings, the Lakota, and people oftentimes refer to as the Sioux, or due north, and the Dakotas, not to mention the indigenous of the Northeast, it's probably fair to say that Texas's issue with the indigenous was more formidable than that faced by any other group of settlers. They had to face the Comanches, uh, the Lords of the Plains, uh, who had a justifiable reputation as being uh, very fierce fighters. The Texans uh, settlers had to face the Apaches uh, to the West, who of course also had a, a base in New Mexico. And indeed, before New Mexico was swallowed by the United States as a result of the war against Mexico in 1846, the Apaches also had a rear base in New Mexico by which they could attack West Texas. Uh, Texas had to uh, face the Cado, C-A-D-D-O, uh, who had an interlocking directorate uh, with uh, Black people. And so because of these formidable foes, it helps to generate a bloody response by the settlers. <laughs> In fact, uh, what's remarkable about Texas is that the liberals in Texas, uh, the few amongst the settlers, thought that the indigenous should be placed on reservations. They were backed up in that notion by many in Washington. However, the hegemonic bloc amongst settlers, the real men with hair on their chest, thought that that was the solution of the wimp, the wuss, that instead of reservations, that liquidation was the preferred option. And they established mechanisms whereby that could be accomplished, including the formation of the Texas Rangers, which in its earliest iteration was probably little more than a death squad. And so this helps to create a very uh, bloody culture in Texas, a bloody culture that exists to this very day. It helps to explain why Texas not only has been in the vanguard in terms of pursuing this very narrow interpretation of the Second Amendment, in terms of having open carry, like this is the Wild West, in Tombstone, Arizona in the 1880s. It helps to explain uh, why uh, Texas has been in the vanguard of other reactionary projects, including the circumscribing of women's reproductive freedom. And as the subtitle of my book suggests, it also helps to explain why if, and I underline if, although there are some troubling signs, if the United States moves to fascism, that Texas will inevitably be in the vanguard of yet another bloody process. Mexico abolishes slavery in 1829. This is a good 36 years before the end of the American Civil War. What's the importance, in, especially when it comes to the narrative that you're presenting here, what's the importance of Mexico uh, abolishing slavery? Well, it's of maximum importance. Uh, it injects uh, fear and anxiety and angst into the mainstream of settler culture. Uh, keep in mind that probably the most valuable investment that the uh, settlers had was their investment in the bodies of enslaved Africans. Keep in mind as well that as you had uh, economic problems due east outside of Texas, for example, the so-called Panic of 1837, 
which is fair to say was a kind of economic depression, not dissimilar from the economic depression in the United States of the, eight, of the 1930s, that you had the enslaver class uh, moving in mass from Mississippi, uh, from Louisiana, uh, from points due east of Texas with their property in tow uh, into the Lone Star State. And so when the, there are stirrings, abolitionist stirrings in Mexico, and keep in mind as well that Mexico was allied diplomatically with Haiti, this uh, stirred uh, something close to hysteria amongst enslavers uh, in Texas and in points due east. And indeed, uh, what happens is that uh, if you uh, leap ahead to the U.S. Civil War, 1861 to 1865, uh, Texas was not only in the vanguard of calling for secession, although there was an influential block of settlers who felt that uh, instead of uh, seceding from the United States, that there should be an alliance with Washington uh, through by dint of this organization called the Knights of the Golden Circle, sadly forgotten, to extend slavery throughout the hemisphere, to perhaps take the parts of Mexico that had not been seized during the secession of 1836, the war of 1846 to 1848, to oust the Spanish from Cuba, which of course was then a slave state, to extend slavery throughout Central America, perhaps to the northern coast of South America, today's Venezuela and Colombia, and establish this formidable slave empire. And so because uh, Texas was in the vanguard of the enslaving process, and because Texas during the US Civil War was uh, kept afloat because of its alliances, with reactionary elements in Mexico, particularly in the city of Tampico. And so Texas was able to export cotton uh, to Tampico, which could then uh, ship it uh, into Europe and then receive in turn supplies uh, for the entire Confederacy. And so what happens is that the US Civil War to a certain extent bulks up Texas because it is the Confederate state least damaged by the ravages of war, certainly unlike Georgia, Virginia, South Carolina, et cetera. And then keep in mind as well that during the US Civil War, actually circa 1862, the opportunistic forces in France take advantage of the US's preoccupation with civil war to seize Mexico. Uh, this helps to explain today's uh, Chicano holiday, Cinco de Mayo, which represents a popular revolt against the Mexican uh, puppet, uh, speaking of Maximilian. And what happens is that uh, French occupied Mexico is also in solidarity with slave owning Texas. And so what happens uh, after the US Civil War is that the Texas settlers do not see that as the end of the war. Uh, they see that at most as a pause before reloading. And so this then helps us to explain Juneteenth, the newly asserted federal holiday, June 19th, 1865, when we are told that uh, General Granger and the men in blue of the US military show up in Galveston and acquaint the enslaved with something they supposedly did not know, which is that they were free. Now, of course, this is this bears on being ludicrous because many of the enslaved did know that. Well, first of all, the Emancipation Proclamation of January 1st, 1863 did not necessarily apply in Texas, just like if US Congress passed a resolution uh, tomorrow abolishing slavery in Mauritania in Northwest Africa, uh, it would not necessarily carry any weight unless and until the U.S. military, and I don't want to put ideas in their head, uh, sent their military to Northwest Africa to enforce that resolution. So that's what General Granger was doing. He was seeking to enforce uh, Appomattox. He was seeking to enforce the formal end of the U.S. Civil War. 
But even that was not sufficient. Because this is one, because this is before the, the constitutional amendments to abolish slavery. Well, of course, it's before the 13th, months before the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution abolishing slavery. But the Texas enslavers, because of the French occupation of Mexico, many of them planned to move in mass to Mexico, reverse the abolitionist decree of 30 years plus previously, and then use Mexico as a rear base by which the United States could be attacked. And that leads to what I consider to be the more authentic Juneteenth, which is June 19th, 1867, when the French puppet Maximilian is captured and slain, uh, which leads to the rise of Benito Juarez, a legitimate hero, uh, not only of Mexico, but I would say uh, progressive forces in the hemisphere. An, an indigenous president. Absolutely. And that brings us closer to the idea that slavery would be abolished. Although, as you know, uh, forms of slavery continue to persist in the United States in 2022. And of course, they continue to persist even after June 19th, 1867, as I detail in the book. And so uh, this uh, story about Texas and its uh, rather fevered attachment to the enslavement of Africans is a story uh, that I'm afraid to say has not concluded finally to this very day. I think when we talk about Going back to 1836 and Texas declaring independence, I think usually when we refer to it, it's with the sense of they just declared their independence and that was that. Did they conduct their own war? Oh, absolutely. Not only did they conduct their own war, but it's important to keep in mind that this was not just a land grab uh, of uh, the Texas settlers led by Sam Houston and Stephen F. Austin and Davy Crockett and the Bowie brothers uh, at all, uh, they were assisted financially and militarily by forces in the United States of America, particularly in New Orleans. Indeed, uh, one of the sub-themes uh, of, of this book is the malignant role of France in this hemisphere. Now, I've already made reference to the seizure of Mexico in the 1860s, but France early on was a booster of the idea of Texas independence. And of course, there were French nationals in profusion in New Orleans. And New Orleans, in many ways, was the key city of what became the Confederacy, a key port, uh, one of the richest cities uh, in North America at that time, not least because New Orleans was the kind of Kmart of the African slave trade. Uh, that is to say that not only did you have uh, Texas enslavers bringing Africans into New Orleans, you had uh, states like Virginia, which by the 1830s was moving to becoming a breeding state. That is to say, breeding Africans to then export them to places like New Orleans. And then, as I pointed out uh, a few years back on my uh, book on Brazil, when Henry Wise, who was a Texas governor, becomes the U.S. ambassador to Brazil in the 1840s. Uh, he, he ironically comes out against the African slave trade, not because he's progressive, because he wants Virginian breeder exporters to capture that market to Brazil, assisted, by the way, by his comrade, Matthew Fontaine Murray, whose statue was just dragged down in Richmond, and who, of course, was involved up to his neck in the escapades with Emperor Maximilian in Mexico in the 1860s in terms of trying to reinsert uh, slavery uh, in Texas. And so the French play a, a very uh, noxious role, uh, that is to say official France, uh, plays a very noxious role in terms of keeping Texas afloat in terms of uh, helping to buy Texas bonds, which allows Texas governmental operations, such as they were, uh, to function. Uh, 
And uh, this is something that uh, I think that Paris needs to be held to account about. This is Letters and Politics. We are in conversation with Gerald Horn. Gerald Horn holds the Moore's Professorship of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston. He joins us for a conversation on his book, The Counter-Revolution of 1836, Texas Slavery and Jim Crow and the Roots of American Fascism. How does Jim Crow, and what is Jim Crow, and how does it fit into your narrative of counter-revolutions? Well, Jim Crow is U.S. apartheid. It's the system of so-called separate but equal. Uh, That is to say, uh, post-1865, post the abolition of slavery, uh, there were many plans and plots, including by the uh, late uh, Abraham Lincoln, to have emancipation, then colonization, to emancipate the Negroes and then send them packing. U.S. Negroes were barely prevented from being deported en masse to the Dominican Republic, for example, post-1865. There were plans to send the uh, black population of the United States en masse to Brazil. Uh, There was talk about sending the black population en masse to Cyprus. I mean, there were all sorts of schemes to get rid of this black population, but alas, (laughs) there were not many takers for this population for reasons that need not detain us here. And so then the idea then becomes, well, how do we sort of create a society where the, these walls, visible and otherwise, that separate this black population from the rest of US society? And so that leads to US Jim Crow, whereby uh, if you're a witness in a court, Black witnesses are sworn in on separate Bibles, for example. Uh, You have, if your pet dies, there's a so-called separate but equal cemetery for your pet to be buried. And I should say that uh, this is also a reaction to something that I'm afraid that radical and progressive forces have not sufficiently ingested, which is that when slavery was abolished, It was one of the largest seizures of private property without compensation in the history of the world. And if you seize people's private property without compensation, you're bound to generate fury. And that is precisely what happened in the United States, fury in the form of the Ku Klux Klan and other terrorist groups, and fury that congeals in this idea of walling off the uh, black community from the rest of US society. And then you, you think this, then it, I mean when you say private property you're 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 talking about former former slaves people who were enslaved do do you think the government should have compensated slave previously slave owners Well what's interesting is that when slavery was abolished in Washington DC in the 1860s the slave owners were compensated uh, I think that we should be talking about (laughs) reparations to the descendants uh, of the enslaved, uh, much more so than reparations to those who benefited handsomely from free labor for decades, uh, if not centuries. In any case, this uh, fury generated by this uh, mass expropriation of private property Uh, then not only feeds terrorism in the form of the Ku Klux Klan, it it feeds this idea of creating this separate society, uh, which receives the imprimatur of the U.S. Supreme Court, which has not just been playing a reactionary role in the 21st century. Uh, In the 1890s in Plessy versus Ferguson, it puts its imprimatur, its legal imprimatur on the constitutionality of separate but equal, not overturned until 1954, with Brown versus Board of Education in the midst of a Cold War, when the United States was under enormous pressure uh, from the international community because of this ideological contestation with the then socialist camp led by the Soviet Union and with national liberation movements percolating in Africa and the Caribbean in particular, and with these representatives of these movements coming to Washington DC and being treated like US Negroes and in fact, There was an idea that was floated by the State Department to give the diplomats from Africa and the Caribbean 
a button to put on their lapel so that they would not be mistaken for U.S. Negroes and so that they could check into hotels and eat at restaurants without being harassed and persecuted. Uh, that did not uh, gain altitude. But in any case, uh, Jim Crow was a very a powerful system uh, ideologically and otherwise. And I dare say that uh, if my subtitle, The Roots of U.S. Fascism, uh, sometime, somehow becomes a reality, which I'm struggling to make sure that it does not, I'm sure along with many of your audience, but if we are defeated, uh, we will see a recrudescence of Jim Crow, except on steroids. In fact, we might see a system that mixes the worst elements of both slavery and Jim Crow. Speaking of Jim Crow, and is this, or I guess again, you might go back to 1776, but for the for sake of this conversation, the roots of fascism, is this similar to the argument that was made by W.B. Du Bois in Black Reconstruction about sort of the roots of American fascism coming from this Jim Crow era? Well, sure. And in fact, um, I, I, you've interviewed Claudio Sant of the University of Georgia. If not, yes, not yes we have. Yeah. About the look, 1830 Indian uh, Removal Act. Yes, exactly. And in the final pages of that uh, book, I think it's called The Unworthy Republic or something to mm -hmm. that effect, mm -hmm. uh, he cites Adolf Hitler himself, uh, who, who talks about how the genocide against Native Americans, the imposition of slavery, followed by Jim Crow, it, it, it according to Hitler, it's not altogether accurate, it hardly uh, stirs controversy in the international community. And so therefore, if he tried to do the same in Central and Eastern Europe in the 1930s and 1940s, uh, he thought he would be met with a similar level of indifference. Interestingly enough, uh, the Columbia University scholar, uh, Mahmoud Mamdani, in his latest book, uh, cites Hitler uh, to the same effect. And of course, uh, other scholars have pointed out that if you look at Southwest Africa, this nation now known as Namibia, formerly known as German Southwest Africa, uh, you had a genocide perpetuated there in the first few years, the first decade or so of the 20th century, uh, with those at the controls being many who wound up being at the controls when genocide was perpetrated in Central and Eastern Europe in 1930s and 1940s. And their conclusion was that that barely led to a whimper from their point of view coming from the international community. And so I think that uh, when there is an injustice that does not receive a mass outrage, which is what you could fairly say with regard to the increase in slavery in the United States post 1776, with the United States ousting uh, Britain from leadership of the African slave trade, taking place as early as the 1790s with regard to the African slave trade to Cuba, uh, as noted, uh, taking place as uh, early as the 1840s with regard to the largest market of all, the African slave trade to Brazil, and with many seeking not only to rationalize that uh, horrific process, but in some ways to celebrate it, because supposedly this represents a great leap forward for humanity, I, I guess, because uh, many people who had faced persecution in Europe uh, found a sanctuary in North America. Of course, you have to turn that card over and recognize that the price of that ticket was to be complicit in genocide against Native Americans. In fact, uh, in Claudio Sant's book and in other books that have discuss the evacuation, the ouster of the Cherokees from the Southeast quadrant of North America, today's Georgia, the Carolinas, et cetera. What's remarkable is that the Cherokees tried to assimilate. Many of them became Christians. They dressed like the settlers. They developed an alph alphabet for their language. In fact, I, I used their newspapers as a source for my Texas book. And they also enslaved Africans. <laughs> as well, which has continuing ramifications in 2022, I'm afraid to say. 
but they still had to go. They still had to, uh, they still were forced uh, out of their homes. And in fact, uh, I've described this uh, process rather sarcastically and sardonically as a kind of rough, rough house uh, Airbnb where European settlers show up at the homes and sometimes the mansions of Cherokee slave owners and force them at gunpoint to leave and the European settlers move in and, and take their place. So when those sorts of terrible episodes occur and recur and it does not necessarily lead to the kind of mass outrage it so richly deserves, I think it helps to inspire miscreants, as suggested by Claudio Sant, as suggested by Mahmoud Mandani, and in fact, as suggested by W.E.B. Du Bois, that it only helps to inspire these miscreants uh, across the waters. How does President Andrew Jackson who is near the end of his tenure as president of the country in 1836. How, how does he play into this narrative of a counter-revolution that you write about? Well, Andrew Jackson, as you know, was a favorite U.S. president of one Donald J. Trump. Uh, he uh, took his uh, portrait out of mothballs and put it in a prominent place in the White House. Uh, Andrew Jackson had roots in Tennessee where he was a slave owner. And in fact, uh, Andrew Jackson was a comrade of uh, well, Sam Houston, who also had roots in, in Tennessee. Sam Houston, of course, being one of the spearheads of the Council Revolution of 1836, the city that I am now located, uh, Houston, Texas, uh, took his name. And Andrew Jackson, initially, he was somewhat ambivalent about the secessionist movement, not because of anti-slavery, but because folks need to realize that the ambition of independent Texas was to be a challenger to the United States of America. Their ambition was not necessarily to crawl into the Union in 1845. And in fact, from its inception, independent Texas was trying to beat the United States in the race to the Pacific and take California, which would then serve as the beachhead for reaching across the Pacific into Hawaii, which the United States does in the 1890s, and then on to the lush market of China and India, et cetera. And uh, I suggest in my book that one of the reasons why the United States puts its Bantustan Indian territory, today's Oklahoma, on the northern border of Texas was in a way to keep the settlers in Texas busy uh, fighting disgruntled Cherokee, Choctaw, Seminoles, uh, et cetera, uh, who had been ousted from their land and deposited uh, in the middle of North America in today's Oklahoma. And, and, and to a certain extent, uh, that did uh, tend to keep the Texas settlers preoccupied and did weaken the Texas Republic to the point where it did have to crawl into the Union. But uh, as matters evolved, uh, Andrew Jackson became a cheerleader for the accession of Texas into the United States of America, uh, because of course, by joining the United States of America, uh, that meant that Texas could no longer be the kind of rival to Washington that it first envisioned. But as many US abolitionists said at the time, this was a kind of poison chalice when Texas entered the United States of America, because number one, I should say that there's some question about the legality uh, of Texas entering the United States of America. That is to say, it, it entered by dint of a majority vote in Congress uh, there is legal reasoning to suspect that it should have been a supermajority. So I guess if Texas moves to have its referendum next year, which the Republicans have promised on secession, they might rely upon that kind of legal argument. You're going to have a referendum on secession next year? Uh, the Texas Republican Party, 8,000 strong, met in Houston just a few weeks ago. And amongst the bizarre resolutions, emerging from that body was a resolution 
to reconsider the question of secession. Now, I should say that uh, I'm opposed <laughs> to Texas secession, not least, and I think people in their own states should be opposed to Texas secession, I, I, although I know, I know many will say, good riddance to bad rubbish. But I think that's a bit short-sighted because if you look at history, Texas will immediately seek to uh, round up a, a, a posse of the like-minded including Bolsonaro, if he's able to fix the election in Brazil, the Paraguayans, they, they'll, they'll, they'll develop a reactionary block to challenge Washington. Not to mention the fact that Texas, because of the factors I mentioned a moment or two ago, how they were such energetic enslavers, how enslavers from points east uh, brought their so-called property into Texas as the Civil War was collapsing, Texas has the largest black population in the United States of America. And so... If Texas secedes, you're going to put these black people in Texas in a, in a real bind. And if Texas secedes, it'll probably be a laboratory for this unique form of U.S. fascism. And I shudder to think uh, what will befall the black population of Texas, including, I should say, selfishly myself, if Texas uh, wins or the settlers in Texas win this referendum. Is this a reaction to a Biden administration and right now a uh, Democratic controlled government or or would they do this with a Republican president in Congress as well? That, that's hard to say. Uh, as you know, this is Trump country out here. And if Mr. Trump prevails in 2024, I would speculate that the rush towards secession would slow down. So I do think that it's a response to having democratic control of the White House, the Senate, and the House. As you know, the governor of Texas, Greg Abbott, has made a big deal about what he says is the Biden administration's reluctance, unwillingness to, quote, control the border, unquote. As you know, they have this latest maneuver whereby they put those who cross the border uh, without proper authentication and papers in buses and send them to Washington, D.C., send them to New York, et cetera, which the authorities in Washington and New York are complaining about. So I would think that if the Republicans make a comeback in November, as many expect them to do, and a further comeback in November 2024, that the rush towards secession might be slowed. But I, I can't say that definitively, uh, because there are many other reasons why Texas may want to have secession, if I may. That is to say, if you look at your newspapers today, you'll see that there's a dispute between Mexico and the United States over Mexico's state control of the oil industry, which goes back to President Cardenas in the 1930s. And Texas oil men who play an outsized role in the political economy of the state might decide that they'd have a better chance of seizing the oil riches of Mexico if Texas were detached from the United States and would not have to observe international niceties, just like Texas felt in the 19th century that the United States was lagger in terms of pressuring Mexico to return enslaved Africans in the thousands who had fled to freedom from Texas enslavement. And that becomes an impetus for Texas to secede from the United States. So those par parallels are a bit too eerie to discard. Going back to the 19th century, talk to me about the importance of the Mexican-American War. Well, it, it's huge. As you know, it, it leads to uh, California uh, becoming part of the United States. Uh, California today, by some measures, the fifth largest economy on planet Earth. Uh, by many measures, the most populous state in the United States of America, uh, not to mention uh, Arizona, New Mexico, and, and, and other points that are too numerous to mention. So 
it uh, increases the land mass of the United States by several orders of magnitude. It places the United States finally on the Pacific, giving it the opportunity, as suggested a moment or two ago, to then seize Hawaii in the 1890s and then establish a foothold uh, in the biggest market of all, which is China. And uh, this is very significant. And keep in mind that Texas settlers had a major role uh, in the war against Mexico. They had a major role in terms of settling Texas, had a major role, excuse me, settling California, had, had a major role in the politics of early California, a major role in terms of the enslavement process in California, which of course never reaches the dimensions of Texas, but was significant nonetheless, which as you know, has led to Sacramento recently uh, making a resolution with regard to reparations uh, to black people because of slavery. So the war against Mexico is significant. And, and, and obviously uh, with regard to Mexico itself, it stirs and reinforces these uh, anti-Yankee sentiments could fairly be called anti-imperialist sentiments that I would argue is still a part of the political culture of Mexico, which is one of the reasons why this present controversy I just enunciated over Mexican oil uh, needs to be watched very carefully uh, because just as in Canada, part of the political culture of Canada is that Canadians are not like the United States. Part of the political culture of Mexico is that Mexico is not only not like the United States, uh, it helps to fuel a certain kind of anti-U.S. imperialism. Anti-U.S. imperialism, which you saw on display uh, when AMLO, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, the president of Mexico, visited Havana uh, against the wishes of the United States just a few weeks ago, arriving on Mexican shores in the past few days have been a cadre of Cuban doctors. You know that AMLO boycotted the Summit on the Americas in Los, An in Los Angeles just a few weeks ago because of Biden administration's wish to exclude Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua. So uh, there are many reasons for us to keep a close eye on our southern neighbor because the histories of Mexico and the United States have been intertwined for decades now. It is interesting to think about the similarities between 1776 and 1836 in this narrative of counter-revolution that you've been writing about for a long time now. And I think of when you talk of 1836 and you talk about the role of both slavery and the war on American Indians, the Comanche and, and others in Texas, it's also in 1776. Again, you have the fear of abolition sentiment spreading across England after the James Somerset decision uh, that predated by a decade or so before the, Revol the Revolutionary War. But you also have colonists in the colonies who are angry at King James III because he is prohibiting the colonists from further expanding westward. He actually respected in some ways the treaties that were signed with, with the indigenous people? Well, yes, the, the Somerset's case in 1772 in England, which seemed to suggest that uh, London was moving towards abolition of slavery in England. And of course, that decision was eventually e effectuated. Um, it stirs apprehension in the slave owning heavyweights of North America, including George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, uh, James Madison, Patrick Henry, a murderer's row of founding fathers. And then uh, King George had stirred controversy further. And London had stirred controversy further a decade earlier in 1762, 1763, uh, with the so-called Royal Proclamation, uh, whereby London expressed displeasure at continuing to wage war against the indigenous population so that land speculators, like land speculator number one, George Washington, could thereby profit. And so uh, I think it's long past time, particularly for those folks who consider themselves to be progressive, particularly by those folks 
who understand that the United States may be on the cusp, may be on the verge of a unique form of neo-fascism to try to get a more accurate understanding of the origins of this country, because it may help us to understand how and why we got into this pickle and perhaps how we can dig ourselves out of this deep hole in which we find ourselves. In other words, there were material factors that led to the breach with London in 1776, planned in labor in the first instance. Uh, it's no accident that uh, when Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, tried to secede from the British Empire in 1965, uh, one of the presidents that they cited, that is to say the Rhodesian Front's Ian Smith, was that uh, 1776 had formed the president for a settler's revolt and that uh, Rhodesia wanted to evade and elude uh, one person, one vote, which would lead to African majority rule, and perhaps leading to a African parliament uh, seizing the property of the settlers, which in fact is what happened a few decades after 1965, when this unilateral declaration of independence took place. And so you also need to realize that settlers revolts, uh, particularly uh, in places like Algeria, where you had a settlers' revolt uh, in the 1950s, uh, which led to a massive bloodshed. And indeed, uh, going back to my theme of the linkage between uh, France and Texas, what's interesting is that a U.S. national hero, the Frenchman Alexis de Tocqueville, whose democracy in America is still assigned in colleges across the United States, because it seems to, to reinforce U.S. patriotic sentiments. Well, what's interesting about to, to Tocqueville was that his approach to the Africans in Algeria uh, probably exceeded the bloodiness and the bloodthirstiness of the settlers in Texas. And in fact, the settlers in Texas were studying Algeria in order to learn tips on how to liquidate the indigenous you may also recall that eventually the uh, settlers decided that the better part of wisdom in terms of dealing with the uh, parched uh, desert regions of North America was to import camels, just like they had camels in North Africa. And so uh, I think that it's well past time for progressive forces in, in particular to try to develop a materialist analysis material factors as the motive force of history, as opposed to what, what does that now mean? What does that mean? A land, factor. labor, as opposed to the idea that people were lusting for liberty in the abstract, freedom in the abstract. Liberty to do what? Liberty to enslave Africans, uh, in contrary to what they interpreted Somerset's case to mean in 1772. Uh, freedom to snatch the land of the indigenous, uh, contrary to the Royal Proclamation of 1762-1763. And so uh, I, I think that where we are in the United States, uh, as suggested, with Republicans perhaps on the verge of yet another victory in November, perhaps a larger victory in November 2024, uh, with all of these uh, newspaper headlines, <laughs> about, as you see in July 25th, uh, 2022, New York Times on the front page, about law enforcement officers and sheriffs deciding not necessarily to follow the law with regard to voting. Uh, we've now devolved from states' rights to county rights, <laughs> where sheriffs and counties say that they're the ultimate authority. <laughs> Just like in the 1960s, you had Governor Wallace of Alabama saying that he was the ultimate authority uh, in that sovereign state of Alabama and did not necessarily have to uh, follow the rules uh, as enunciated in Washington. So we're in a very dire and desperate situation here. And I think we could do worse than try to have a more accurate understanding of how we got here. Gerald Horn is the author of the book, The Counter-Revolution of 1836, Texas Slavery, Jim Crow, and the Roots of American Fascism. He holds the Moore's Professorship of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston. Professor Horn, thank you. Thank you for inviting me.